Hey everybody, Brian Hoagley. Uh, welcome back to Cecil Life. Joined with me on a fabulous Tuesday. It is Tuesday, right? Yes, it is. It's Tuesday before RSA, actually. Oh, stop it. Uh, Dimitri joins us. Here. I see you're not going. I'm I'm not going again. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that I have the not at RSA again this year. What am I going on? Twelve years running, something like that. I I think I'm. You know what? I need I need. To, can you send it to me? I want to borrow that because I I I haven't been and I'm not sure I will ever 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 go. I actually purpose built that uh, that overlay for Esmond Kane <laughs> at uh, Stewart Health last year. Hi, Esmond. Um, yeah, so I mean, look, it's not a bad conference. It's um, I think you know, it's just not for everybody. It's like you know, it's like anything. You know, it's not everybody's into everything. I think it, I think it was really useful a couple of years ago. I think you know the feedback I get now is it's a great time to go reconnect with friends. Which, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily want to go and go to a cybersecurity conference to do that. I'd rather invite people over to my house and drink a beer and hang yep, out to reconnect yep. with friends. But hey, uh, you know, teach their own. So, um, Dimitri, what's your thoughts on, like, uh, have you heard anything about what's going on at RSA this year or um, most otherwise? Of the, most of the things I've heard were I'm reconnecting with old friends. <laughs> we I actually have seen some of the emails we have the best food and the best activities. That's how they're pitching it right now. That's how vendors are pitching mm. for you to come. So it's pure. It's purely, you know, the the, the visuals of best it. Best food and activities. I mean, I've I could probably find that at a really nice hotel somewhere down in Key West, Florida. And and I bet you at like quarter of the price quarter that it is price. right now at RSA. I mean, for you to, right now, for you to get to RSA and have any kind of experience, we're talking thousands of dollars for economy seats and like no luggage and then more thousands for like a three-star hotel right. an hour away no yes yeah, about something like that so if this was all that and then you go to a, a conference where your mind is blown with unbelievable technology but majority of people that are going there are going there to meet other people not even going like oh i already know all this technology so right. I, I, it's not consumer electronics. Right? No, it's not. It's not like you know. It's it's built for like you know B to C. This is cybersecurity is predominantly a business to business type of and commodity you know, commoditized more and more these days. So you're right. going like we went to an auto show yesterday, day before yesterday. Beautiful cars, right? You get to yeah. sit in the thing. What do you What are you going to do there? Like another fourteen of vulnerability management vendors, or or you know who knows? So I have a hard time justifying it to anyone. If you're in San Francisco, or if you're a vendor, that's a whole different story. Sure. Then, I mean, you're a vendor, so maybe you need to go because of that. I am a vendor. So I've, you know, like any cybersecurity conference, and not just RSA, other conferences, um, you know, you're constantly weighing, you know, what's going to be the ROI on this. We just did a phenomenal one, right, Secure World, right? We, I actually really like Secure World because it's local um, to Boston, right? They have, Brad does a great one in, in Boston. Hi, Brad. Um, and... It's a great one. I mean, we've 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 sponsored it before. We've um, had a booth there. There's a you know there's an interesting ROI that you got to calculate. You know, how many people do you send right to man the booth so you can be effective, versus how many leads you're going to get out of that and the type of quality conversations you you get coming back. There is an ROI I think for very well established players. I think it's it's difficult for startups or smaller companies trying to break in, but you know. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes somebody's looking for the thing that you just figured out how to start doing, and that's part of your startup, and there's interesting. I do believe there's a good ROI for potential partnerships being built between vendors. That that I definitely felt was significant. But, you know. So, so maybe that's the thing now. Maybe instead of it being a customer-focused or sales-oriented, maybe it should be more of a trade. A trade show. A trade show. Yeah. Where it's... You know, customers come if you if you want, and obviously there'll be value for you here. But our priority is into in advancing the industry, right. and that's not not enough of that is happening. So events like what you said, like like secure, I love Secure World, is primarily because of its constant like controlling the size. It's not huge, mm -hmm. it's not small. It's just the right size yeah. for for both of those things. Because they do, I think it's because they do it regionally, so you're yeah, able to true. kind of spread out. You're not yeah. thinking, okay, RSA happens once a year. It's in one location. Everybody descends on it versus maybe regional conferences. Yeah. And again, there's regional conferences aren't always the best either, right? There's there's pluses and minuses to that. You've got Careful. maybe only. Careful. Well, I'm just saying you, you've really <laughs> only got. So here in the Northeast, right, you, you're only going to get exposed to probably yeah. the Northeast sales teams. Yeah. Right. You're not going to necessarily get people coming in. Maybe you don't even have 
the senior leadership from bigger companies, yep. right? Who are going to go to a more regional conference to represent the product. You're going to have your regional teams. Your, you know, maybe you're just big enough to do East West U.S. Yep. Maybe you do have regions. Who knows? But you know, um, the CEO of any of the major cybersecurity vendors will probably be at RSA around the booth, be able to have conversations with high prospect clients or potential clients, right? They're not necessarily going to go to all the regional type of conferences yeah. at a smaller set. So again, there's a plus and minus, right? I guess. Kind of I just, as a CISO, maybe if I ever switch to the vendor side and I start doing something again, maybe, but even then, it's like RSA is now the, it's like you go to Disney because you're going to Disney. Mm -hmm. It's not because you're going to Florida or not because you're going to have, well, any anyway, fun with the kids, but Disney first, then fun with the hit. Right. This is what I think RSA has turned to be. You're going to RSA and then it's all about maybe cybersecurity or vendor relationships or whatever it is. It's it's almost becoming secondary now. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it is. We'll obviously get all the reports back. Please do uh, take pictures of your bingo cards if you are creating or uh, tracking any of that. Uh, I did see Alan Alford picked up a, a really cool one uh, online. And what I did you get? Uh, no, he's just got a really neat oh, bingo card that, card. He, that he found that he shared with some folks. That... You see what we're getting down to? Who's getting a better bingo card? Vendors, by the way, out there. Cool bingo cards and amazing stickers. I saw some really, really nice stickers recently. Hey, there's there's some great swag everywhere. Um, I joked with somebody online after I posted my little not out of RSA uh, overlay about, um, you know, do you think that maybe you could, if you went, you could maybe pick me up a pen, a squishy, <laughs> a tote bag, a hat, a notebook. Uh, a three-pronged uh, uh, cable uh, charger yeah. for a phone, um, a koozie, and maybe, well... We, I guess sanitizer. We sanitizer. I was going to say mouse pad, but we don't <laughs> no, do mouse no, pads no, anymore. No. So, um, so if anybody could pick me up one of those, if you think maybe they'll have them, uh, I'd love it. Um, That'd be really cool. That would be good. Um, well, enough of that. I mean, would like to see some pictures. Comment down below if you uh, have any uh, cool photos from RSA years past. And uh, do come back to this... Uh, to this post either on LinkedIn or YouTube and show us your photos from this year. Take some selfies. Hang out with some friends. Hashtag uh, CISO life. That's right. Hashtag CISO life. And if somebody could get, I don't know, if, like I always love this. It's kind of kind of interesting. Just like from a marketing standpoint, the art that goes into the CrowdStrike uh, APT. <laughs> I don't know if they're robots the, the, or if they're the just name. like. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, I have that try. The, the big guys yeah, that yeah. are set up with all the, it looks like armor. I don't know if they're Stopping robots breaches, or not. Uh, yeah. yeah, whatever that is. Somebody get a picture with them, uh, please. That'd be great. Um, I'd love to. And tag Brian. Yeah, and tag me. I just want to, you know, if you can get into the picture with them so I understand how big they are for scale, <laughs> that'd be good. All right, enough of that. And uh, speaking of vendors, uh, a couple interesting things happened in the news. One, obviously not a security vendor, but has security implications. The other one being a security vendor. Which yep. one do you want to hit on first? Security vendor or non-security vendor? I think let's start with non-security because the uh, the... the underlying foundation of that will explain then why the security vendor is important. Sure. So TikTok's in the news again. <gasps> and uh, what do we have to deal with? Well, let's see. The U.S. lawmakers have decided that they're going to force in some way TikTok to either uh, sell or be sold off from ByteDance. Divest, right? Divest. Um, or um, shut down operations in the U.S. entirely. And I believe ByteDance even responded saying that they would rather pull out of the U.S. market then divest of TikTok, which, bold move, you know, we'll they, see how that plays they, out. Yeah, there's a formula, and I think they have a, a proprietary algorithm and formula that they can't share, or not share, or transfer, right? You can't, you can't split it. But again, I think all those things are public statements for now. I think mm. we, they got, what, 270 days, and then three, nine months, or something like that, to, that to sounds, get that organized. That sounds government y. Government yeah, 270 about, days is generally like a, a good, good grace period for the U.S. government. Period. So there'll be some, there'll be conversations. I mean, I'm already watching commercials. TikTok, you know, like, hey, my whole livelihood is on TikTok. Oh, I saw a billboard driving down yeah, from, there, towards Worcester, Massachusetts, yeah. from where I live, right? And, you know, well outside of Boston, hour outside of Boston, billboard on the side of the yard saying that, TikTok is responsible for X amount of billions of dollars of revenue and jobs and whatever in the area. Yep. I was like, wow, they, they just went right away. They were like getting out there. And what Brian just did by repeating that slogan is exactly what the problem is. Mere presence of that tool of TikTok in our environment is a concern. We have to sort of understand what TikTok is. We are talking social platform, you know, sharing of mm -hmm. short videos and things like that. But that's what it does for you. But what does it do for its owners? owners? Right. And more importantly, what do the owners have to do based on the laws of where they are? Right. And they are 
in China. China. So not a lot of laws probably protecting U.S. interests in China. I would say even more importantly, they actually have laws specifically mandating that they share information with the government. So do we really want a government of a foreign adversary? To put it mildly, that is in, quote, low intensity conflict with the United States already, end quote. Uh, do we really want them to have that kind of ability to gather information? More importantly, I think, that gathering information is their ability to influence public opinion. Yeah. And that, I think, is much, much, much bigger problem. And, and in my mind, if we can disarm TikTok, split him, right, have him be running here by all means. Sure. What I'm really concerned about is their ability to influence public opinion with how they manipulate data flow, how they concentrate certain topics with certain people, certain sure. uh, uh, groups of people, teenagers, young adults, you know, you name it. And we really need to get down to the reality that we are in a world war that is sort of spread around the world right now. And yep. a lot of it isn't kinetic. It's not shooting and dropping bombs. It is this yeah, exact psychological thing. warfare. Yeah, yeah. No, you're. So I've given a. I've I've weirdly given a lot of talks over the last two years on TikTok and the concern of the app itself, which I'll post down below a couple different talks I gave, both for the National in Canada and for NBC, and actually on Maria Bartolomo's uh, morning show yep. uh, two years ago. Look at you getting on. Yeah, that. yeah. I was happened to be in New York at the time. Um, they uh, just the app itself, like what it can do. What can the app do if it's just on your phone, right? It can it can basically see kind of you know side to side, right? What what can it see? Bluetooth connections that you're on, Wi-Fi that you're on. Maybe it can't read the data, right? But it can look at all the metadata about you. Where are you going? Who are you near? What else yep. do you? What other apps are you using? What yep. other apps do you not use a lot? You can determine a lot of information based on ancillary, you know, information to somebody. That's a concern, right? Who's controlling and managing that? Who's programming that? Who's who controls the CICD pipeline for the TikTok app and what they can do? Then there's the data aspect, right? Who has the data? What can they use the data for? Can they use it to influence, you know, hey, I, I believe that, you know, this group of voters in this part of the United States is kind of on the fence or they've been swing states previously or we've seen data that, you know, they just need to get pushed over this way and it could change an election. Right, whether it's locally, at a state level, or at a federal level. I mean, data scientists do this for legitimate reasons on behalf of the DNC and the RNC. You insert a foreign adversary into it, says, hey, I want it to go that way. They've got now access to that information, and they've got a front row position to the user on their phone to be able to just go and say, hey, I'm going to show you this because I know what you're looking at. I know your interests. Yep. And let me just start peppering you with some more information to maybe get you to start thinking this way, right? How many billion of dollars we just uh, sent to Taiwan as, as a foreign aid? I mean, that's like, like right there, that's on the table. That's just some very scary stuff. We're, I mean, I, I was born in USSR, born, you know, a place where this was a government level system methodology to m maintain and manage your population. They just didn't have the tools like TikTok right. back there. And now we have it, and we are letting them operate in our environment. Right. I think tactically, operationally, and strategically, that is a big mistake. And it seems to me that our lawmakers are thinking the same. They are finally thinking the same. Um, I've, I said, I think, a year or two ago that it's going to be very hard to kind of put this genie back in the bottle. Like, the app is out, right? And I, I believed and I said the only way that they could ever get around actually removing it out of the U.S. populace would be forcing the app stores, Apple and Google, to force remove that app from its stores and somehow pull back somehow from phones. I mean, just think about this. When the iPhone came out, Apple pushed U2's album to everybody's iPhone, right? But it's a great example of the fact that they have the power to do it, right? Now do we need, now do we either ask them or force them to wield that power yeah, and as a good. And it's tough because it's very, I mean, that billboard you're talking about yeah. and all those in revenue, that's not necessarily not true. That is the impact, but we have other options. And I think politicians are often missing the point of bringing reality to its population. And I think if they were realistic about what the problems are in describing mm -hmm. that, I think we have that, I think it could be 
we could convince our population this is not a terrible move. We're right. not restricting freedoms. This isn't about freedom, democracy, or even economics. This is purely about protecting American protecting society. ourselves. Yeah, yeah, this is us. It's and not just American. Western, in right? General. Western Western society and and ideals. And it's yeah, we're not removing an app that just shows funny cat videos. Right. This has a deeper, more profound impact on the way we look at things. And 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 let's be honest. Most social media does too, right? I think the big difference is yeah, that really the other social media platforms that have a really, you know, lion's share of the market uh, are U.S. based, and they're going to hold to U.S. laws. They're not going to upset the country that they're in, right? And I think they're going to be playing nice. They only want to make money. They don't want to kill you. Yeah, right. we do have. We do have. <laughs> I mean, but you know, it's, it's it's not funny. But people don't think about this. Like, they just think it's funny cat videos. Like, why would you take that away from yeah. me? You know, it's it's, it's on us like to bring the back. It's a ministry of no again. This is our problem. I know it is terrible. Speaking you know. of, isn't that there's another? This is what we're talking about, right? This is the cybersecurity one that you. So the other guys, yeah. right? They just happen to be Russian <laughs> in in uh, their structure and Kaskur, uh, Kaspersky, Kaspersky is yeah. back in the news again. And the founder just happens to be a KGB or an ex, though you're never an. I was ex, gonna say no one's ever no an ex KGB officer, right? You're you're you know so founder is a KGB officer. Uh, and they are laws similar to Chinese laws about participation and control of the of, of development and so on. Again, I mean, in this case, Russia is literally in conflict, armed conflict. Right. Uh, shot down in a Reaper about a year ago over mm -hmm. Black Sea. I mean, we're talking literal warfare. Oh, yeah. And we're going to let them operate again in this environment. And now these guys are... Root access, right? It's an antivirus. Oh, yeah. You're gonna, you're literally gonna give him root access and invisibility to your environment. Now, back in the day, I used to love Kaspersky. Just it was, it wasn't a bad tool. I, I, you know, if you just think about it, it probably isn't a bad tool right now. But is this the risk we can take within the context of global? conflict that is right. that is happening and again i don't know if we can if we can do that well the u.s government has um uh, because we've put um two software products onto gsa which is how the u.s government and federal and state can purchase software and gsa has components that stipulate you know these are the companies that are not allowed on gsa cannot be sold through gsa and they ask you are they part of your supply chain do you have any involvement with them yeah. are you reselling their product but the U.S. federal government came out and basically banned Kaspersky products Correct. In, in its entirety. Um, Maybe they know something. I'm pretty sure they do. Uh, and, <laughs> and you know, so they made that that uh, that statement, and they kind of put their foot down on that. Um, you know, they did it with, it was, I always say it wrong, Hiwa? Hi, the Huawei. Wa, is it Huawei? Huawei. You don't pronounce the H? Okay. I don't think so. Um, the, the phones, the Chinese. Yeah, the, the Chinese yeah, yeah. the Chinese manufacturer, right? It's like H-U-A. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they did, I mean, they did it with that. So um, the question now is, is like, is that going down to a state level? Is that going kind of across com kind of U.S. commercial is and to business, really push right. in business? Hey, you know, you can't, you, you as a business can't do work with the U.S. government or state governments if you're using Kaspersky products. Yeah. So they're going, they're, they're, they're finally figuring out from a, what can compliance actually do? What can we actually mandate? And let's not just ban the products. Now let's put pressure on the companies to not even buy the products, right? So you got to go where the revenue line is. If you impact a revenue line, you can actually make things happen with cybersecurity pretty actually, well. Yeah, very quickly. <laughs> it works, works really well. It's shockingly, when we just think about the money and the bottom line, it all works. Yeah, it does. Until there's World War II. Three, Three, four, whatever four, you want to call it. Yeah. Right. Well, Dimitri, another another riveting discussion. At, you know, I'm going to not be able to sleep at night uh, thinking about oh, this again. It. I got good drugs. Sleep. I'm sorry, <laughs> didn't say that. Well. I'm a former CISO. I know how to sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or at least I know how to deal with not being able to sleep at night. Uh, any parting uh, any parting words? Uh, make sure there's no TikTok. But I mean, seriously. Talk to talk to your kids because I'm. I mean, this is now at the level where we need to start communicating in a in a way very similar to what we used to do back when you know fishing and things like that and and uh, social media was just starting up and we're telling kids be careful you know don't put things on there. We need to start talking about things like TikTok, like Kaspersky. We need to start thinking and talking about global implications. 1935, 37 is whatever to not where we are now comparing to, let's say, pre-World mm. War II. We're not that far from, yeah. like, open conflict where U.S. troops will be in involved. And these things, 
will have an impact down the line. So, yeah, you know, definitely will sleep well at night. It's it's not just you know I, I think back to like teaching my kid about what not to put online. Yeah. Right. And I think we've kind of crossed that barrier. Now it's about watching where you get your information from. Where are you getting your information from online? Are those authority? Are those authoritative sources? Can yeah. you trust those sources? And even if you can, double, triple, try yeah. and get several sources. We're we're down to like misinformation management. Can yeah. like this is ridiculous, it's crazy. Well, thanks again, everybody, uh, for joining us uh, here in the studio. Uh, not at RSA. Not at RSA. We are somewhere in Shrewsbury in the uh, in the CISO Life Studio. Um, Thanks again for uh, joining us. Do click down below, grab the uh, hit the subscribe link and the bell, get any notifications for future. You'll see us around on LinkedIn. You can follow us using CISO Life and anywhere else on social medias. Be good, be safe, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks.